So, how, do we have any runners in the house? Runners? Okay, I'm not alone. Okay, anyone trained for a marathon? Yes, over here. Anyone ran a marathon? Yes. For me, those are two very different things, right? Last year, I trained for a marathon, and I gave up about six weeks in. There is no way I'm going to make it, right? Um, but about two weeks in, it was a Friday, where I was running, and my lungs had started to adjust, right? And my sides weren't hurting. I'm like, yes, this is awesome. I'm doing great. I'm timing myself. And I'm booking it out Roberts Creek Road, right? And I, there's a break in my music. I can't run without music. And so there's a break in the music, and I hear a dog. Now, if you don't, if you don't know me, I don't animals. Like, I don't get along with animals whatsoever, right? Like, we had... One dog growing up, and it was like basically a little rat. His name was Taz, and he was tiny. But I don't animal, and so immediately there is fear in my heart. Where's the dog? <laughs> Where's the dog? And adrenaline just shoots through my body, right? And then I hear another bark, and it's getting closer. Its proximity to me, proximity to me is getting way closer. And I remember it's like slow motion in my mind. I look, and I turn up the driveway I'm running past and I see the dog. And it is bounding down the driveway, jowls bouncing like a tornado of slobber and teeth towards yours truly. And I'm like freaking out, right? I'm like, this is survival mode right now. I need, I need to get out of here. So I book it, right? It just like, phew, it's, uh, as fast as I could to get away from Fido, right? Needless to say, I had the best time on that run that I've ever had, right? But here's the catch, for the next week, I avoided that route. Like, there is no way I'm gonna run into Fido again, you know what I mean? Like, I wanna keep my life, I don't wanna lose it to a dog. I naturally wanted to avoid fear, as humans, because fear and scary situations, the storms of life are painful, we naturally want to avoid them. Today we're gonna look at a story, though, where Jesus sees his friends in a storm, he, he doesn't remove it. We're going to be in Matthew 14. Now, the context to this story is uh, 40 hours before this, Jesus just found out his cousin, John the Baptist, has been beheaded. And he's grieving, like he's stricken with grief. He goes off to a solitary place by himself. And anytime Jesus tries to go anywhere alone, like just the crowds just show up, right? He's, they, moms, what you feel when you try to go potty, that's what Jesus was feeling, right? Like he can't get a break, right? So, Jesus, he goes off to this solitary place, and tons of people start showing up. 5,000 men show up, plus women and children. They may have been, some scholars believe, between 10 and 15,000 people showing up to see Jesus. And you've probably heard of this miracle. It's, it's the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus basically takes some kid's sack lunch of fish and bread and says, hey, we're going to have a party, we're going to feed everybody. And he feeds everyone there. And then there's 12 baskets full left over. So that uh, the disciples saw this, and they were just amazed, right? They were a part of it. They got to see this extreme miracle. And then at the end of it, Jesus, they're, they're like, Jesus, we want you to be king. Like, you're going to, we'll never have to go to the grocery store again. Like, for serious, like, you'd be our king. You'll provide for us. It'll be great. And Jesus dismisses the crowds. No, nope, it's not my time yet. He dismisses the crowds. And then he tells his disciples, I'm going to go up on the mountain by myself. I'm going to go be alone. I'm going to process this grief. I'm going to pray to my father. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get in a boat. I want you to cross the lake, and I'll meet you on the other side. And that's where we pick up our story today. Matthew 14, starting in verse 23, it says, Later that night, he, that he is Jesus, was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So Jesus, he's up on the shoreline, he's alone, he's by himself, and he can see the disciples in the midst of a storm. We know from the, the same accounts of this story in Mark and in John, both in chapter 6, that they were three to four miles from the shore, and that they had been straining against the waves. And this was not just any small squall, this was a big storm. They were straining at the oars. The word in the Greek that is used to describe this storm is megas. This is huge. This is like they're trying to survive. And he's off, and he sees them in the waves. 
And shortly before dawn, Jesus went to them walking on a lake. I just love Jesus. Like, what? Who does that? Who walks on a lake? I sure don't like anyone else. No. Liars. My kid is a liar. <laughs> My kid raised her hand. That's all. <laughs> When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said and cried out in fear. Have you ever had one of the situations where in life you're just like you're in the storm and everything seems to be blown out of proportion? Like, it could be the smallest thing and you're just like, nope, that doesn't. Uh, it's, it's the camel's back. Like, I, I can't do it anymore. The disciples, they're rowing, they're straining at the oars, they're exhausted. And then they see Jesus. They know what Jesus looks like. They know his luscious locks. I'm sure he had an epic beard, okay? Some sweet robes. And he's out there walking on the wave. They know what he looks like, and they catastrophize the situation. They think he's a ghost. Catastrophize is a real word, by the way. It's awesome. But use it this week. But anyways, they go from, if it's not bad enough, we're going to die. Great, a ghost has showed up. This is awesome, right? They're freaking out. And look at Jesus. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Remember, the disciples are in chaos. They're freaking out. Are we going to survive? I'm exhausted. Where's Jesus? <laughs> it's a ghost. <laughs> and Jesus comes in with perfect peace. Hey, guys. Be courage. I'm here. Like, don't be afraid. It's okay. Total chaos. Perfect peace. And I love Peter. Peter's always the one to put his foot in his mouth, like he always talks first. And he's like, Lord, if it's you, I'm not really sure this is Jesus, but if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Peter knew one thing about Jesus, that he could help him do the impossible. And if that was really Jesus on the waves, in the midst of the storm, notice, the storm is still going on. This hasn't stopped. The storm is still raging. And Peter says, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. What? That, that doesn't make any sense. Like, that's, I still don't quite get why you ask that question. Like, that's illogical. Like, I can't go stand on top of the water, especially in the midst of a storm. And he says, if it's you, I know one thing about Jesus. He can help me do what's not possible. And Jesus says, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on water and came towards Jesus. Now, I don't know what Peter's whole spiritual walk looked like, but I am sure this moment was the monumental moment in his walk so far, right? He's stepping out of the boat. He's got his eyes fixed on Jesus. He's trusting him, and he's walking on top of the water in the middle of a storm. Like, this is a huge marker for Peter. And he's walking towards Jesus. He's looking at him, and they're doing, yeah, Jesus, we're doing this thing. When he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. He is looking at Jesus, and he averts his eyes. And he's looking at the wind, and he's looking at the waves, he's looking at the storm, <coughs> and he begins to doubt. And it says, immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? I love, immediately Jesus does this. He doesn't wait, he doesn't say, well, Jesus, you really, or Peter, you really failed me, like, you didn't trust me, so it sucks to be you, dude. Like, he just, like, immediately reaches down after Peter. And then he says, you of little faith, and actually in the Greek, that is, he calls him the name Little Faith. Isn't that awesome? He's like the first rapper, like Little Faith. <laughs> so cool. Little Faith, why did you doubt? Jesus reaches down, he catches them, he asks them this question, and when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. The storm's been raging this whole time. It doesn't stop until they get inside the boat. Then those who were in the boat, remember there's other disciples in the boat saying, they're worshiping him, they're saying, truly you are the Son of God. Now this story is full of fear for the disciples, like this is a terrifying story for them. And we know how it all ends, but for them in this moment, this was terrifying. And in order for us to have a new perspective on fear, not as something to be avoided or to cower away from, but as something to, in the midst of the storm, look to God and say, what do you want to teach me? I think there's a few things we can take from this story. First thing I want you to see is Jesus waited. Jesus waited. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them on the, walking on the lake. They had been straining at the oars all night. 
uh, in, I believe it's in John 6, the same story is told, and it says that he waited till the fourth watch. That's between 3 and 6 a.m. All the mamas know that time, right? All the mamas know that time. Jesus waited. You know, he could have snapped his fingers from the shoreline and stopped the storm. He could have, when he showed up, right, he's standing on the waves, he's showing them his power. He could have stopped it then. But he chooses not to. He chooses to allow the storm rage on. And I believe it's because when we're facing trials, when we're facing storms, when there is fear in our hearts, there is something that God wants to teach us. Because fear provides an opportunity for growth. It doesn't guarantee it. Your response to the scary storms in life matters, but it provides an opportunity for growth. Uh, over the last two years, it's been pretty difficult for my family, my wife, and my kids, and I. Um, two things I've known since I fell in love with Jesus. One, I'm supposed to love people. Right? That's one of the commandments, right? <laughs> love people. And then the other one is, I know I'm supposed to teach. And at first I thought, maybe I'm supposed to be a math teacher, but I'm terrible at math. You do not want me to be a math teacher. Like, and so it became clear, though, that teaching meant teaching God's Word. And I remember early, early, early on in my, um, in my journey here, uh, Pastor Will sat me down and began asking, hey, what would it take for you to become a pastor? I don't know, dude, you tell me. You're the pastor. I'm not, Right? And I began this wrestle in my heart <coughs> and walking towards, I believe God had given me this dream, like this dream to shepherd and love your people and teach. It would have been so easy if God just made that happen. It would have been easy. Because for the next 18 months, I went through a process here at Family Church that was difficult. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you guys are aware. We have directors and pastors, and there's a pathway for directors to become pastors. And to go through that process, you had to be willing to sit down with people and allow them to just look at your life and say, hey, I think this is an area that you need to grow. Uh, I see this in you, and it's immaturity. If you're going to walk into what God's calling you, you need to change this thing. And it was tough on my family and myself. And there are moments where I'm like, God, I am walking in obedience to you. I, I, I'm loving my family. I'm loving others. I'm teaching. I'm, I believe I'm doing what you've called me to do. Why are you not bringing this to fruition? Why is this storm continuing to rage? You know what I heard? It's a silence. <laughs> Nothing. And it would have been so easy for the storm to just been taken away. Right? The moment God gave me the dream. Oh, it's yours, buddy. But God had something he wanted to produce in me that otherwise he couldn't. Why? Because I'm a prideful guy and a storm will humble me and Jesus has my attention in the middle of a storm. It would have been easy, but I'm so glad and I can honestly say, looking back on the last two years, I'm glad God didn't remove the storm. I'm glad he didn't take away the difficulty and the pain that I was feeling because I believe that the question should be flipped. Instead of saying, God, deliver me from this. Take this away. This hurts. It should be, God, can you deliver me through this? What good thing do you want to produce in me? What, what are you trying to teach me in the middle of the storm? This hurts. And yes, it hurts. And Jesus, I need you to be my comfort. But I know there's something good you want to produce in me. And Jesus waits. He allows his disciples to wrestle. Fear provides an opportunity for growth. So here's my question for you. Where are you waiting on God? This almost always looks like unanswered prayer, at least for me. When you pray because finances are tight, or the job is lost, or there's loss of relationship, or there's strife in marriage, or the parenting isn't going well, or someone you love dies. And it feels like, God, where are you? I'm walking in obedience. Why is this storm still raging? What if it's the most opportune time for him to produce something good in you through the storm? 
What if Jesus loves you so much that he's allowed, willing to allow you to go through a storm so that he can bring goodness into your heart and into your life? So Jesus waits. He doesn't remove the storm from his disciples. They're wrestling. They're out there on the waves. And he comes to them. The next thing I want you to see is Peter walked. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on water. This is awesome. This is the monument for Peter. This is against logic, right? Like, doesn't make sense. You don't walk on water. Not only that, Peter was a professional fisherman. And like Storm 101, stay in the boat, right? Stay in the boat. Don't get out in the wind and the waves. Like, stay in the boat. But he does it. He's, he's got his eyes fixed. He is watching Jesus. He's trusting him. He's put his faith there. And he gets out of that boat. And he is walking on the water. Because faith can overcome fear. In fact, I believe it is the only thing that both can overcome fear. If you're looking to yourself, if you're looking to your family or your job or anyone else but Jesus and faith in Jesus, you will not overcome the storm. You cannot overcome it without faith. And Family Church is so good at providing terrifying moments of opportunity for growth. I'm telling you what, my first uh, service opportunity here at the church, um, I was in the youth group when it was under uh, Brent Costner. He was the youth director at the time. Awesome dude, love him. Um, but he, uh, early on, he had me bring in the, the cookies, and I loved it, because like, I came and there was like, you know, six kids at the time, and it was like, I got cookies, and everyone loved it because I was a cookie guy, right? But pretty soon, he's like, hey, I, I think I see something in you. Would you be willing to teach? And I was like, me teach? I'm an introvert. There is no way I'm going to teach. I didn't really know what I was talking about. I had no clue what God had. But I was terrified, right? But he kept having that conversation with me. He kept bringing it up, kept bringing it up. And eventually, I said, all right. Yeah, I'll teach. And I was so scared. I needed six weeks just to mentally prepare to be in front of four kids. Okay? Like, that's where I was, right? I was terrified. But then I, he told me what I'm teaching on. And I was like, my fear just got Im immensely huge, right? First John 4. If you've never read it, it's testing the spirits. What? What does that even mean? Like, do angels take SATs? I don't get this, you know. I was so confused, right? And, but he lovingly walked me through, right? And he knew this was a big step for me. And I remember the day I got here, and uh, I had my sermon ready. I was sweating bullets, you know. I'm beat red, just terrified. There's four kids in the front row, and I'm just like... And I had manuscripted the whole sermon. I wrote it. It was basically like a book reading instead of a teaching, right? And I sat up here. But um, one thing Brent had told me, he's like, hey, when, when we read the scripture, like the actual passage, uh, they don't really pay attention. And that's the most important piece. So here, can you draw attention to the passage? Like, okay, I'm going to, I got an idea. I'm going to teach them something. So I had them all stand up when I read the passage, right? And then I continued to read, and I literally read like this in 1 John 4, and the angels don't take the SATs. And I'm just like <laughs> reading the passage and reading my sermon from the paper, so terrified I didn't look up once. At the end of the sermon, I said, Amen, after my prayer. I look up, they're still standing. They're still standing. The whole time they were standing, right? The kids are like, hey, is. It's so What's going on? And the, even the leader's like, I have no idea. This is super weird. <laughs> right? But I looked up and it affirmed my fears. Right? Well, I can't do this. Look, I just, I stepped out in faith and I failed. No one heard this. This was garbage. That's how I felt. And then later that night, after we were done, um, my wife and I, we were cleaning up some stuff and I had a student come up to me. She said, I know you feel like you messed up, and that was pretty weird, <laughs> but can we talk? Because some of the things you said impacted me, and hear about her life, and her family, and her background, and share Jesus with her, and that wasn't because I'm so great, I messed up, right? But stepping out in faith, God sustained me. God worked regardless of my failure. Peter 
steps out. In his fear, he, he practices his faith. And he's not standing on top of the waves because he's so great or he's so strong or he's like so buoyant. You know what I mean? Like, Peter is not a flotation device. <laughs> he's standing on top of the waves because the God of the universe is sustaining him as he stepped out. My question to you is, where are you being called to step out? Where are you being called to step out? And I want to talk to two specific groups of people. Um, the first group, there, there are people here today, I believe, that they've never stepped out of the boat. That the waves and the wind seem too scary. That the idea of giving Jesus control of your life is too overwhelming. And, you, and, you, and, and scary, there's just, no, I can't go there. I can't. I want to give you a small picture of the person who wants your life. Jesus, God in the flesh, came down, lived perfectly, never did anything wrong. And then, around 30 years old, he was publicly beaten, mocked, ridiculed, went through a mock trial, and then he was murdered on a cross. And he willingly, please hear, willingly went through that ordeal for you. That's the God who's asking for your life. He willingly went through that for you. So if that's you and you're in the boat, I just want to encourage you you can't waver forever. You can't, you can't just stay in safety. I know it feels safe. It's not. This will never be a pressing issue in your life. There's never going to be a deadline until your life is over. <coughs> if that's you today, it's time to begin that conversation. Time to begin that wrestling. What does it mean to follow Jesus for real? The other group... At some point, we have decided to give our lives to Jesus. But you know, he calls you to scary things. You know what's so easy? It's easy to come here on Sunday and get some God and get some grace and have an experience with Jesus and feel excited about God and then leave and put God in a box on a shelf, and Monday morning we go to work, and we don't bring Jesus with us to our workplace. No one knows that we love Jesus. And then we come home Tuesday to our family, and our marriage is falling apart, but we don't bring Jesus into the marriage. And Wednesday, our parenting isn't so great, or relationships at school aren't so great, and so instead of allowing Jesus that, we continue to operate in our own power. And then we feel bad about how, how these things have played out. And so we open our guilty pleasure box. And we get some joy from there that's momentary. Then we feel bad about that and we open our God box back up again and say, I need some grace. And we put it back in the shelf. It is so easy to compartmentalize our lives and say, God, I'm going to put you here. I'll get you when I need you. And Jesus says, forget the boxes. Give me your life. Like, give me all of it. Give me your mess. I love you. I love it. I love you in your mess. You, you don't have to pretend like I can't see these things. Give me all of it. The place that God is probably calling you to step out is the place in your life that you're unwilling to give him, that you've put in a box on a shelf and said, Jesus can't touch this. So where are you being called to step out? Peter steps out of the boat. This is the hugest moment for him. He's walking on the waves. He's got his eyes fixed on Jesus. And then he wavers. Peter wavered. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. That word, but, if you have your Bible, circle it, underline it, put an asterisk next to it. That is an important word. This is a monumental moment for Peter, and then there's a threshold for him. That, that but is a threshold for his faith where he is no longer trusting in Jesus. He takes his eyes off of God, and he looks at the storm. And beginning to sink, he cries out, Lord, 
save me. He begins to doubt. Because doubt comes from where you're focused. If you've got your eyes fixed on Jesus, you're not going to have a problem in the middle of the storm. But if you look at the wind and the waves, you don't have hope. Doubt comes from where you're focused. This last year, during that time where I was uh, pursuing becoming a pastor, um, there was a marker moment that happened for me. I came to church on a Sunday morning. I didn't really want to, if I'm honest with you guys. Um, but I came anyway, because that's what you do. And Paul, Pastor Paul, spoke a, a sermon, and he talked about the correlation between faith and fear. And I felt the Holy Spirit, God, tell me, you are living in fear, buddy. Like, you're afraid of your past, you're afraid of your present, you're afraid of your future. If I'm honest with you guys, I'm afraid of God. I was afraid of, uh, that I wasn't saved, that I didn't have the identity in Christ. I was terrified. I was living in fear. And after service, I went back to the prayer corner back over there, and Jerry and Denise Emery were back there. And uh, I love those guys. Um, they, I, I just shared my heart with them that I, I'm struggling, like I'm doubting so many big things, and and God, if this is the dream you've given me, why is it not happening? I'm just wrestling. I need you. And I feel like I'm getting nothing, and so I'm doubting everything. And I love this moment, because Jerry, he's not like a touchy-feely guy, but he puts his hands on my shoulders. And he looks me straight in the eye, and he's like, Bud, we're going to pray for you, but I first want you to see, Jesus died, so you don't have to worry about all that sin. The past, present, and future, that's done for. That's taken care of. You don't have to worry about it anymore. He took it to the cross for you. And he said, but that's not all that happened when Jesus died. He made it so that you can confidently come to God through faith. And it was, for me, this mind-blowing, monumental moment where I realized my eyes are on the storm. I'm looking at the wind and the waves, and this feels overwhelming. And Jerry and Denise were able to help me shift my focus back on Jesus. Here's my question for you. Where are your eyes fixed? Especially when the storm is raging, where are your eyes fixed? This is why community is so important. If Jerry and Denise didn't say, hey, remember Jesus, I'd allow that storm to rage on. This is why it's so important to be here on Sunday. This is why life groups are vital. We cannot do this alone. We can't. We're not meant to. We're made for relationship. We need each other to be able to do this. Because there are moments in your life where you're going to waver. Your faith is going to have a threshold, just like Peter. And you're going to be looking at the wind and looking at the waves, and you're going to struggle. And you need someone around you to say, look at Jesus. Don't forget what he did. Where are your eyes fixed? I love that they just simply and very pointedly pointed me back to Jesus. They didn't have fancy words. Just look at Jesus. Look at his sacrifice for you. I love it because you can see Jesus' character in this story. So when Peter wavers and he's sinking, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught it. He didn't wait. It was an immediate reaction. You have a little faith. Why did you doubt? And I always wrestled with, why did Jesus ask him this question? Jesus knows <coughs> The answer. He knows why Peter doubted. I think Jesus asked Peter this question so Peter know, would know why Peter doubted. I think, in fact, I think there are a lot of reasons why Jesus allowed this storm to go on, but one of them is that he wanted to be able to ask this question of Peter's heart so that Peter would know, Jesus, if I'm honest, um, I don't think you can handle the storms of my life. Why did you doubt? If you're not willing to ask that question in the middle of your storm, you could miss the entire purpose on it. Because there is some good thing that Jesus wants to produce in you. Don't miss the purpose of the storm.
even when it hurts. I've got two next steps I want, to, I want to challenge you guys with this week. Firstly, what fears do you need to give to God? And I, I want to encourage you, don't, don't be general. If it's your, your kids, be specific. I'm worried my kids aren't going to come to Jesus. That's one of mine, my fears. I want them to know Jesus. I want to be the best example I can for them. So be specific. What, what fears do you need to give to God? And here's the scary part. Remember, we need community. We need each other. This is not just a gathering where we just come and then we leave. This is important. This matters. Share that with someone you trust. Share those fears. There is something healing about saying, I am really struggling with this. Can you pray for me? Can, can you just hear me out? Every Wednesday I meet with my mentor, Zach, and, and I just lay out my fears, and he does the same to me. And there is healing there. We need each other. Share them with so many trust. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that you died, not just so we could be forgiven, but so that we don't have to walk in fear. In the middle of a storm, we can say, I know God's got me. I can walk on top of this storm because Jesus will sustain me. And in those moments, Jesus, when our faith hits a threshold and we begin to waver, God, give us the focus on you. Help us to be people who are reminding each other, don't look at the waves. Look at Jesus. And God, I pray for courage and bravery for all of us, myself included, to be honest with someone this week about our fears. We love you, Jesus, in your name. Amen.